About Ralla a year ago, I made a video on Batman and Son and its adaptation Son of Batman, which I opened up with the declaration of Batman and Robin are and have always been a father and son team. That video was mostly dedicated on Batman's biological son Ibn al-Suffaksh, or Damian Wayne as he is more commonly known as. But in that video's opening I also argued that the other children that Bruce Wayne has taken into his care are as legally his children as Damian is. However, when you look at how many of those kids Bruce has taken in to save from what he went through, it's no wonder how the original first one, aka Dick Grayson Nightwing, and the younger Damien have been given the most attention to, that the literal middle children have ended up being treated as just that, as middle children. So in this video, I decided to talk about the first middle child in the Batman family, aka Jason Todd, the second Robin who went to become one of Batman's most painful failures in that comic book story that I initially wanted to make this video on. But before skipping over to that, I'm first going to tell you how we go with Jason from here to here. Before Crisis on Infinite Earths, Jason Todd was pretty much a Dick Grayson clone who grew up in the circus and his family was killed by Killer Croc. After Crisis on Infinite Earths happened, DC did something akin to rewinding the timeline backwards, besides just rebooting everything. And so in starting from Batman issue 408, the new stories were set in the post-crisis continuity, where Bruce relieved Dick Grayson from his duties as Robin after almost getting shot by the Joker in front of enough witnesses. In my head canon, this is what made Dick tell his fellow Teen Titans, as well as to Deathstroke and Wintergreen spying on them through Terra's contact lenses, that he is going to stop being Robin. So, while the Teen Titans were going through the Judas contract, Batman was having a casual stroll around Gotham and interacted rather casually with the locals as this was still the Bronze Age of comics. Then that illusion of everything is fine was broken when Batman returned to the Batmobile to discover that this young street hoodlum had stolen its tires. Catching the young Jason in the act and following him to his apartment, Batman learned of how Jason's mother Catherine was dead with his father Willis doing time in the big house, so naturally Batman decided to send him to a local boys school in the area run by a seemingly nice old lady named Magan, who was revealed in the issue's cliffhanger to be running a school training future street thugs. Eventually, when Batman caught Jason after having stolen some other car's tires, Jason ratted out on Magan's criminal operations to him and let Batman know where he had sent him to. While Batman caught Magan in the act of overseeing her other students trying to rob a museum, Jason warned Batman of an incoming ambush and even beat up the last student Batman had missed. This is what then gave Batman the idea to take Jason under his wing for proper training and turn him into the next Robin. That origin story has more or less been consented to cut out the boy school part out of it and make Batman take Jason in to be his next Robin from where they first met. Your mileage may vary on if Bruce took Jason immediately after catching him from stealing in the tires from the Batmobile, or if he did it later after trying to do something else first. In my opinion, it would be seen better to show that Batman was not actively looking for a replacement Robin so soon after releasing giving Dick of the position. And witnessing that Jason had the potential in him is what made Bruce choose to put that potential into better use as Robin. Anyway, for the next two real world years, Jason Todd was the next Robin in the stories that were rather 80s, like the Ten Knights of the Beast, where KG Beast first appeared and Batman left him trapped underground, and then there is also the cult which could be its own video, where Jason was portrayed rather inoffensively in supporting Batman fight Deacon Blackfire. I say inoffensively because during those two years, Jason's time as Robin was not received as favorably as expected by the readers, who saw Jason more as a rebellious brat than Dick had been. This started around the time when it was revealed that Jason's father Willis had been working for Two-Face who had killed him. And then there is Batman issue 424 with the story titled The Diplomat's Son. 
The title character of that story was a hate sink named Felipe Garzonas, whose father was an ambassador from a fictional nation of Bogatago. Long story told somewhat short, Jason as Robin rescued a woman named Gloria from Felipe, who then used his father's diplomatic influence not to be arrested. Jason being Jason would not let that go, and wanting to make sure Gloria was safe from Felipe, caused Batman to suggest that if they were to catch Felipe on a drug bust, that would cause his father, Jose, who was running an anti-drug operation in Bogatago with the US assistance, to be forced to recall Felipe back home. Eventually, after a week of stakeouts, Batman and Robin were able to catch Felipe trying to get the white stuff from someone working for his father, and we can only imagine what kind of Paskabursk would have happened from that father-son reunion. But before Philippe was to be recalled back to Bogatago, he made a threatening but ultimately fruitless phone call to Gloria, who did not know that Philippe was on his way out of the country. And by the time Batman and Robin reached her apartment to make sure she wouldn't do anything drastic, it was too late. When Batman then turned his back to call Gloria's situation to Commissioner Gordon, Jason went after Philippe. By the time Batman caught up with Robin, he could only see Philippe falling down from his penthouse balcony. And to this day, it has not been revealed if Jason pushed him or if Philippe slipped and fell from being spooked by Robin's appearance. Only Jim Starlin, who wrote this issue, probably knows the answer to that question. But the ambiguity was used in the following issue when Philippe's father Jose came to Gotham to avenge his son's death. Then the killing joke is also supposed to be said somewhere before or after this story, with what Jason was doing at the time being unknown. But now I have managed to build up to that story I wanted to make this video on. Batman A Death in the Family, written by Jim Starlin and drawn by Jim Aparo, where DC Comics let the readers vote on how the story ends, and supposedly someone voted multiple times. I also went over the story arc with Robert, and his video with me on it is already up on his channel. For this video, I will be using the physical copies I have of these three Batman specials from 1989, that I managed to find from some event some years ago, which are also translated into Finnish. Here is the time code for where the review starts, in case you want to skip the story commentary. And before we start, a somewhat small trigger warning to a... <sighs> Chapter 1. The story opens by setting up the toad that makes it clear how it's not suitable for children. In it, Batman and Robin have tracked down a ring of child porn smugglers, and Robin approaches them exactly like all of us would. <laughs> Batman, however, recognizes that Robin is acting too hastily and is fighting too emotionally, as he lands on two perverts trying to shoot the boy Wonder to the back. When all the perverts are down, Batman scolds Robin about attacking them before he gave the order and almost got shot. But the boy Wonder doesn't mind about almost close calls and just tells the Batman that their work, just like life itself, is a game. Calm yourself. Haste will only lead you to making an ill-timed mistake. An unstable heart is the worst armor one can have. Later, Bruce shares with Alfred that he may have made a mistake in making Jason a Robin too early, before he had emotionally matured from his parents' deaths like Dick had. Alfred so suggests, and Bruce agrees, that it might be for the best that Jason was put on the bench for now, and that is where Jason walks in not liking what he hears. Bruce tries to be stern but fair in telling Jason he meant what he said, and offers to help him with his issues, but Jason only ends up storming out. Batman is in the next scene then being told by Commissioner Gordon that the Joker has again broken out of Arkham, and as this story is set after the killing joke, Batman and Gordon are taking it more seriously than before. The Joker himself also acknowledges that he needs to get out of Gotham after what he did last time he was out. And since most of his assets have been frozen and confiscated by the authorities, the Joker tells his henchman Rupert that they are going on a work holiday in Lebanon. 
where he plans to sell his unregistered cruise missile to Arab terrorists for a high price. Oh, just a little of the good stuff for a new time machine return pad. Coming right up! Meanwhile, as Jason is walking around his old neighborhood after storming out of the Wayne Manor, he arrives to his parents' old apartment building, which causes Jason to be reminded of his parents' deaths to... I think Catherine Todd has since been retconned to have died to a drug overdose, and Willis Todd was killed by Two-Face. Jason is then snapped back into reality when his mother's acquaintance suddenly spots him, and gives him some of his parents' old stuff that have some water damage. While Jason takes the box to his room in the Wayne Manor, Batman is shown catching one of the Joker's thugs, and learns that his enemy is planning to travel to Lebanon. Back to Jason, who after going through his parents' old stuff, ends up discovering his postcard-sized birth certificate, which reveals that his mother was not Catherine Todd as he had thought, but rather someone else whose name starts with S, and the rest of that name is messed up by the water damage. It's still enough to make Jason believe that his real birth mother could still be alive somewhere out there in the world. And with the detective work taught to him by Batman, Jason uses his father's old black book with the Bat computer to find three possible candidates for his birth mother. Mossad agent Charmin Rosen, Spy. Lady Shiva, who at this point of DC's history was just a hired killer, Horosia and Sheila Haywood from Doctors Without Borders. Remembering his last confrontation with Bruce and Alfred, Jason decides against telling them about this discovery, and leaves for Israel on his own to start the search for his biological mother with Charmin Rosen. I'm going to see... my mother. Meanwhile, the Joker is shown flying to Lebanon with his missile and Rupert while Batman finds the warehouse the Joker had been storing his cruise missile in. The readings on his Geiger meter makes Batman realize that Joker has a nuclear weapon that he possibly plans to sell to terrorists in Lebanon. In returning to the Batcave with the intentions to follow the Joker, Batman is told by Alfred that Jason has run away from home, and now he has to choose which one is more important for him to focus on. Being Jason's parental figure in staying to look for him, or pursue after his nemesis with a nuke. Chapter 2 In the next part of the story, Batman is shown working with CIA operatives to secure the plane Joker had used to bring his missile to Lebanon. After letting them take the plane, Batman calls to Alfred for any news about Jason, who is in Israel and breaking into a... Mm, Mossad site as Robin to hack into their personnel files and learns that Charmin Rosen is in Beirut. Bruce is also in Beirut, asking his taxi driver in rather humorously calm way to be taken to the city's worst crime area, where he changes into Batman and questions the locals about who would be buying the Joker's new. After getting a name of a buyer, Peter Brando, and a hotel, Bruce goes to stake out that hotel, and there he finds Jason, who tells him how he is in Beirut looking for his biological mother while also explaining why. Bruce is also then forced to tell Jason they only bumped into each other by a coincidence, and that the Joker with the nuke is a more pressing matter. Fortunately, Jason doesn't need to be disappointed for too long, because then they realize that Peter Brando and Charmin Rosen are moving together, meaning that Batman and Robin can work on the same case in following them to the desert where the Joker is selling his cruise missile, while also mentioning in Lebanese Arabic to have disassembled and assembled it by himself. One of the potential buyers expresses interest to fire the missile at Tel Aviv, but before that gets to happen, Batman and Robin start to fight the enforcers in the area. The Joker panics and gives him the money he got from the buyer to Rupert, while Batman and Robin keep fighting their way to him. Charmin Rosen also ends up blowing her cover in saving Batman from being shot to the back, and is restrained by Peter Brando. At this point, a lot of things are happening at the same time. As Robin charges to save his possible mother, Batman recognizes he cannot reach Brando in time to save Robin from being shot, but luckily as a Mossad agent, Charmin Rosen is able to use Robin's distraction to take down Brando. And then the Joker's poorly assembled missile blows up when the Spire tries to fire it at Tel Aviv, with Rupert holding the Joker's money getting caught in the blast. Honey, I'm afraid Rupert had a little injury. 
Oh, Rupert, please live! Please, I'll never be short with you again! Luckily, it was not the warhead that blew up, and the Joker is seen walking away, sad that he lost his money. As the dust has now settled, Batman lets Robin ask Charmin if she has had children in Gotham. Confused, she tells them she has not, and so they drive back to Beirut where they go their separate ways. One down and two to go. Batman and Robin leave to look for Lady Shiva next, as she is also supposed to be in Beirut, and on his own end, a disguised Joker buys a plane ticket to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Chapter 3 In their search for Lady Shiva, Bruce and Jason learn that she was caught by unknown men to their car, and so this is now a rescue mission for Batman and Robin. Meanwhile in Ethiopia, the Joker with a beige skin makeup approaches the last of Jason's mother candidates, and reveals that Sheila Haywood is working at this refugee camp because she lost her medical license for doing illegal abortions back in Gotham. So, the Joker blackmails Sheila to help him with something she owes him, or else he would let her superiors know about her past. <laughs> Okay, and back to Lebanon. Batman and Robin have made their way to their kidnappers camp in the desert and are taking them out as they are also shown to be observed. And by now I can probably drop these pretenses and remind everyone who Lady Shiva is. She started out as an enemy of Rickard Dragon and a professional assassin before other writers after Denny O'Neill put their own spin on her. So in this story she is used as a hired coach in a camp training terrorists, and observing Batman and Robin take down her students have so helped her recognize what flaws they have. Lady Shiva opens up by tranquilizing Robin before engaging in combat with Batman, and since this is Lady Shiva we are talking about, she naturally ends up dominating the fight until Robin comes back with senses. Jason is initially conflicted over helping his father figure or possible mother, but eventually helps Batman take out Lady Shiva, leave her students tied up in a ditch and blow up their munitions cache. I'll set my charges and blow the shit out of them. Then they interrogate Lady Shiva on if she has any children, and based on her reaction, let's just say that Cassandra Kane was not created until a decade later during No Man's Land, and Lady Shiva was retconned to be her mother even later than that. Meaning that when she says that she has never had children while under the influence of Truth Serum, it becomes very much confusing to comprehend if you happen to be a fan of or know about Cassandra Kane. Anyway, that cuts out Lady Shiva from Jason's list of possible mother candidates, leaving Batman and Robin to next head to Ethiopia. Chapter 4 and in this chapter's opening, Bruce and Jason arrive to the refugee camp in Ethiopia. In their first meeting with Sheila, she immediately realizes who Jason is when he is named, and that reaction makes it clear that Sheila is Jason's biological mother. Bruce gives them some space to talk and reconnect, as Sheila then explains to Jason the circumstances of what happened between her and Jason's father. Long story short, after giving birth to him, one of those illegal abortions that Sheila tells Jason was a failed surgery, she lost her medical license and Jason's father ended up falling in love with another woman. Sheila was not in a situation to start a custody battle, and so gave Jason up for his father to raise and the rest is history. The mother and son have now been reunited, but have to separate again when Sheila has to get back to work and Jason is sent to work passing soup, and then he sees the Joker arrive and go into Sheila's tent. Naturally, Jason goes to eavesdrop on them, learns about Sheila being blackmailed by the Joker, and eventually learns that the Joker is using Sheila to steal medical supplies from the camp's warehouse, and replace them with his Joker Venom. After having heard enough, Jason rushes to Bruce to share what he had learned, and so Batman leaves to stop the trucks delivering the poison disguised as medicine on a whirly bat. Before leaving, Batman tells Jason to keep an eye on the warehouse without engaging and wait for him to come back before doing anything. 
Unfortunately, because this is his recently discovered mother, Jason is emotionally compromised and goes to offer Sheila his help while also telling her he is Robin. This then leads to Sheila to think for herself and lead Robin into a trap in trying to settle her death with the Joker, as well as to hide the fact that she has also stolen from the medical supplies. And so we have reached that point of the story, where Robin is first roughened up by the Joker's men, before the Joker grabs a crowbar and goes Gordon Freeman on Robin as his mother smokes what she has. Meanwhile, Batman manages to catch up with the supply trucks with a whirly bat that gets shot down, disarms the guards thinking he is attacking them, and manages to explain to the truck drivers what they are really delivering. As that situation is being dealt with, Batman has to take one of the trucks so he can return back to Jason, who as Robin has during this time been beaten to the inch of his life by the Joker. Then, when Sheila asks how the Joker plans to avoid Batman coming after him for Robin's treatment, the Joker decides to apply the Scorched Earth tactic and destroy the evidence, with Sheila as a witness being left tied up in there by blowing it all up with a bomb. After the Joker leaves, Jason gets barely back up but is not in a shape to defuse the bomb, so instead, Jason uses whatever strength he still has left to free Sheila from her bindings so she can help them both out of the warehouse. As they try, Batman is shown to be on his way there and chooses to let the Joker drive past him, and one second away in the warehouse, Sheila realizes that the Joker locked them up inside. The warehouse then blows up as Batman arrives to see it happen. Chapter 5 as Batman is going through the ruins of the warehouse, his mind goes over to remind him about Jason's time by his side, and the ups and downs that have led to them both to this moment. Then Batman is snapped back to reality when he finds Sheila still barely alive in the rubble, who tells him what the Joker did, and how Jason tried to save both of them before the bomb went off. Before she dies, Sheila praises Jason one last time as a good boy who loved his mother. As Sheila then dies, Batman lays her back down before resuming to look for Jason, and ultimately does find him. Knowing in denial that there is no pulse, Batman reaches for Robin and lifts up to carry what used to be the closest thing he had to a son. Elsewhere in Addis Ababa, the Joker is delivering the medical supplies he stole to his buyer, who are accompanied by... You know what? The version of this story that I have is censored, and these people approaching the Joker are here identified as Odradekian secret service agents, whose leader is kept of panel whereas in the uncensored version, they are Iranian secret service agents, and the Joker is set up to meet with Ayatollah Khomeini. But since we're going by my copy of the story, I'm going to go with the Joker being approached by the Odradekian government and talk about this case of censorship later. Meanwhile, Bruce has done the best he is able to explain Sheila's and Jason's deaths to the Ethiopian authorities, as well as arrange for their remains to be transported to US for burial. Bruce then leaves them to look for evidence to the crime he knows was committed, and later as Batman finds the Joker as other warehouse, where he has left his goons killed off and an invitation to an obscure address. That is all Batman needs to know in hunting for the Joker, as he then prioritizes to lay both Jason and Sheila to rest in Gotham. Their funeral is only attended by Alfred, Commissioner Gordon and Barbara, who after what the Joker did to her in the killing joke is visibly shown to be in a wheelchair. As the service goes, Bruce decides not to let the world know Robin is dead, and also asks Alfred not to contact Dick, who as Nightwing was on Tamaran with the Teen Titans during this story, about what has happened. Later, Batman tracks down the obscure address the Joker left for him to the United Nations building in New York, where he is confronted by Superman who was sent to intercept him by the State Department. 
This is because the Joker has been made the Odradekian ambassador and so been given diplomatic immunity to all of his past crimes. Meaning that Batman cannot go after him without causing an international incident. This scene is actually built up with Superman trying to tell this to Batman without revealing that the newly arriving Odradekian ambassador is the Joker, which caused Batman to try punch Superman on this page that ended up as a shortly meme. And the issue then ends with the Joker arriving and rubbing his diplomatic immunity on Batman's face. Chapter 6 In the opening of the final part, Batman is told by a CIA representative what Superman pretty much already did, that he cannot go after the Joker now that he has diplomatic immunity. The US government does not want to risk an international incident, which is why Superman is asked to keep an eye on Batman, so he won't do that by going after the Joker. Clark does however empathize with him in acknowledging Jason's death as his Robin, and Bruce tells Clark that Sheila's dying words are enough evidence for him about the Joker having killed Jason. Superman still has to tell Batman not to go after the Joker because that would make him an enemy of the United States, but Batman instead tells him that he is going to do what he has to. Later Bruce is shown reserving himself a seat as an unofficial observer for the next UN General Assembly where the Joker is supposed to speak at, and is clearly shown to be emotionally compromised with what he does next. Go confront the Joker after he has been preparing for his speech for the assembly. Batman tells the Joker, while clearly holding himself back, to go back to Arkham and calm down, to which the Joker responds to by taunting him about Robin's death and regretting not having been there to see the look on Batman's face when he found Robin's remains. Batman takes the confession and turns to leave now knowing for certain that the Joker killed Jason, which will make his next move easier. And so in the following evening at the UN General Assembly, Bruce can only sit and watch as the Joker arrives dressed in a traditional Arab headdress and robes, which so adds cultural appropriation to the list of Joker's crimes besides just murder. On his way to the podium, the Joker and Bruce end up having a staring contest that lasts six panels, during which Bruce keeps mentally reminding himself that all of this is happening because Batman didn't kill the Joker when he had the chance. While the Joker is probably thinking Bruce is someone he has hurt and can do nothing about it now with his diplomatic immunity. And then the Joker delivers this speech where he talks about having found a home in Odradekia, which he is proud to represent and feels kindred spirits with the nation. That is then why the Joker decides to defend Odradekia's tainted honor accused of terrorism by committing a terrorist attack in releasing his laughing gas he was hiding under his robes on all of the other country's delegates. Bruce naturally cannot change into his Batman costume to stop the Joker in time, which is why this situation is so a job for a disguised Superman, who sucks all the gas into himself and leaves to blow it out somewhere safe. The Joker responds to this setback with his backup plan, which includes concealed bombs that create a smoke and dust screen for Batman to appear before his nemesis, who fights back and ends up killing one unlucky delegate. This angers and motivates Batman to charge after the Joker more when he flees to the roof and attacks to leave via GET TO THE CHOPPER! Batman catches up to climb on board the helicopter, where the Joker's old Radekian allies begin to open blind fire at him and end up killing the pilot. Batman also ends up getting shot and chooses to save his own life by leaving the Joker into the crashing helicopter. The story finally ends with Superman picking Batman out of the water and being told to find the Joker's body from the wreckage, with Batman not being optimist about it being discovered, as he laments about everything between him and the Joker ending up unresolved. A Finnish YouTuber I follow, and whose videos unfortunately do not have English subtitles, once made a joke like this. Not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims, and even Breivik will convert one day. 
I could only assume that Jim Starlin, Jim Aparo and Denny O'Neill as their editor had that same idea when they decided to make the Joker work with Arab terrorists operating in Lebanon and Ethiopia, before making him a political representative of Iran slash Odrarekia. You need to acknowledge that this story was told in the 1980s, not far after the 1979 and 1981 Iran hostage crisis, which Batman himself references in chapter 5. But like Robert said in his video where we went through this comic together, the Iranian connection and Ayatollah recruiting the Joker to be his ambassador well, now we're getting to the point that dates this story horribly! For that reason, DC has gone to retcon it in the later stories to make the Joker be an ambassador for one of DC's fictional Middle Eastern nations like Kurak. More about that later, but now let's talk about the original premise of this story. Denny O'Neill had to keep telling people after the storyline ended that DC and its writers were not the ones who killed Jason Todd, but instead it were the readers who were given the power to vote on it. Between the final two issues, or chapters 4 and 5, there was a 36 hour window where the readers could call two separate phone numbers to vote on if Robin would or would not survive the warehouse explosion, and the vote landed onto the Kill Robin side. That naturally divided the readers as well as the critics, but in retrospect most people have come to agree that killing off Jason Todd's Robin was the right thing to do, and it made something of a mundane story better. It turned the Joker into a much more serious threat in the aftermath of the killing joke, and gave Batman a new motivating loss that made him go from a scared little boy in the alley crying over his parents to a grown man mourning the loss of the closest thing he had to a son. Robin's death or the build-up towards it was done with a balanced attempt to have Jason be doing something heroic and selfish at the same time, to keep him as the same character he had been portrayed as for the previous two years. His final moments are gory and horrible at being portrayed by his mother before being beaten to the inch of his life by the Joker, but the fact that Jim Aparo's art is framed with the same coloring and lighting as the rest of the issue somehow ends up feeling like it's missing something. Aparo did frame what he drew here to show how desperate the situation is to Jason, but somehow or maybe it is the fact that this was meant as a Schrödinger's cat situation, where the readers were expected to dictate where it goes from here, and the fact that for me there is the no shock value because I know what's coming after this, causes this scene to feel more ominous than shocking or horrifying to me. But then, there is also this hope spot moment where Jason comes back to his senses and uses the final seconds of his life to try save himself and his mother who moments ago betrayed him to end up in this state. To quote another version of Jason's murderer, In their last moments, people show you who they really are. Meaning that in his last moments of lucidity, Jason's default actions were to try save a life, and so I would say he had a heroic enough death that Batman knew about as Sheila told him in her last moments when he found her. Which makes it an actual shame that Sheila has gone ignored by DC writers, and I assume new readers who have only watched Under the Red Hood movie or played Batman Arkham Knight. More about that movie and its source material when I get to it, but the fact that Jason's mother is usually adapted out from the retellings of his death seem to be conscious choices to make him look worse than how he was seen during his original tenure as Robin. And then there is, in probably trying to avoid the casual Islamophobia the latter third of the story showcased, the Joker being made the Iranian or Radekian Gurakian ambassador with diplomatic immunity has also been downplayed, along with Batman's reaction to it, along with his willingness to avenge Jason's death, and without Batman's response to trying to get justice to the closest thing he had to a son. How many writers and readers have since then taken to see Batman as an uncaring jerk who made Jason an expendable child soldier? 
Seriously, the fact that Jason as Robin is killed in this comic story might as well be the one and only thing that casual DC and Batman fans know about it. And without acknowledging Jason's abandonment issues that caused him to try find his biological mother, Jason Todd is seen as the failed Robin who brought his death onto himself, while Batman might as well have let it happen. This could have been fixed back in 2020, when DC Animation made an animated movie to adapt death in the family, and which could have focused on telling the real story as shown in this comic, while also rewriting Lady Shiva's section to make more sense with Cassandra's existence, as well as doing some overhauling with the Joker becoming an Iranian or Radekian Kurakian ambassador. And maybe make Raj Al Ghul be one of the potential buyers for the Joker's cruise missile, or of those medical supplies he blackmailed Sheila to help him steal. But unfortunately, what we ended up with was a lazy and pathetically sad cash grab. Okay, I don't know how to explain this movie other than as a cash grab. Or actually, this in-name only adaptation was made as a choose your own adventure in presenting what if scenarios spawning from the only scene that people seem to acknowledge from the original story. AKA from where the Joker leaves the warehouse after doing his Gordon Freeman impression to Robin who is not accompanied by Sheila. However, there is some added lead up to it that is somewhat well lifted out from the source material. But unfortunately this animated movie was also done as a 10th anniversary celebration of the Under the Red Hood animated movie that came out in 2010, and which I will also cover when I get to it. And because that movie had made up its own backstory around Jason's death with established detail, this backstory was held back by trying to go with that movie's established continuity. But it did get some things from the comic that worked well when applied to the lead-up flashbacks on how we ended up at the warehouse. There is this one scene, recycled from the Under the Red Hood movie, where Robin acts out on his own without Batman's guidance when fighting criminals, which leads to Bruce later scolding Jason for his actions. Then, as some new animated scenes, we get Bruce and Alfred talking and agreeing to put Jason on a bench from Robin activities. There is some acknowledgement to how Two-Face killed Jason's father and his mother dying to an illness, but instead of being portrayed as understanding on where Jason's problems are coming from, Bruce just declares that Jason is a danger to his mission as Batman as well as to himself. Just like in the comic, Jason hears this and then runs away because there was probably no animation budget to have Bruce try to offer talking with him about his abandonment issues. Then the movie skips to the next flashback on how Bruce and Jason coincidentally met up in Bosnia instead of Lebanon, because that is where the Under the Red Hood movie said this happened. The script is somewhat flipped over in this scene, as Jason did not come here to look for his potential biological mothers, but instead to hunt down the Joker who had escaped from Arkham after the events of the killing joke happened. Well, thank you for doing that right! Unlike how the Killing Joke movie fucked it up. And Bruce is after Raj Al Ghul, who is working together with a Joker in using him as a distraction. This realization is then supposed to lead to the same happy conclusion that Bruce and Jason can work together as Batman and Robin, as in the comic where they saw Peter Brando and Charmin Rosen walking together. 
Okay, not exactly the same situation, but I take it. And then the flashback skipped to a point where Batman has to catch up with the trucks transporting uranium for Raj instead of Joker Venom disguised as medical supplies. Instead of a whirly bat, he uses a bat cycle. And before leaving, Batman tells Jason not to engage with the Joker and just observe the warehouse he is using. Batman tells this to Jason word for word as it was in the comic, meaning that the movie made Batman focus on telling Jason not to go get himself killed. But without Sheila being Jason's biological mother, who has made him emotionally compromised, the implication is that Jason disobeyed Batman's orders just to disobey them because he is the rebellious brat Robin. And going forward from there, the rest of the movie is essentially a recap of the Under the Red Hood movie, with Bruce Greenwood narrating it as Bruce Wayne to Clark Kent. There are also the other what-if scenarios, but they have as much to do with a death in the family as One Punch Man has to do with My Hero Academia, aka absolutely nothing. Instead of an anthology movie, this death in the family adaptation being made a decade after Under the Red Hood could have been to it what Crisis score was to Final Fantasy VII in telling a story building towards a foregone conclusion, with Jason's story being told similarly as Zack Fair's. My honor. My dreams. They're yours now. I'm... Your living legacy. That could have helped Jason's characterization and public perception to make more people see him as a more complex character rather than as one dimensional character who is known for just one thing without exploring what factors actually led to that one thing. But instead, they simplified Jason's time as Robin and decided to focus on his Red Hood era with what-if scenarios instead. This movie doesn't even show how Batman's and Joker's next meeting after Jason's death went over, and if Batman was willing to do something or anything to confront the murderer of his son. And Bruce actually does refer to Jason as his son in the narration of the story. Twice. Or I gained. A son. An example to a son. Was it with Batman Ninja when I last complained about wasted potential? Because that is what this animated movie ended up being. Besides also being a shameless cash grab that recycled decade-old footage and made new animations for something that went against being an adaptation in the first place. <sighs> And I will probably be complaining about the same thing when I move on to Hush next. Which, if you have seen the video of me going over it on Robert's channel, is related to Jason Todd's character. That is why I have decided to do it next before covering Under the Red Hood as the logical follow-up. However, when it comes to Jason's successor as Robin, I have been invited to Jay Heat Blaze's channel to discuss about Tim Drake's time as the third Robin before Megan Fitzmartin happened. I link our discussion to the description once we have done it, so now it's time for me to go work on the Hush video next. While you wait for that video to come out, remember to like this video, comment what new points of view you might have gained from it, share this video for more people to see, and subscribe for all the other videos I will also have coming in the future. Also, ding the bell for when I will be doing gaming streams for a chance to chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.